Hello, my name is Dr. Thomas Flagel, Associate Professor of History at Columbia State Community College here in Franklin, Tennessee. Today I'm going to be talking about something I had a long interest in, and it ended up being a story I did not know would end the way it did. It's war, memory, and the 1913 Gettysburg Reunion, the largest blue-gray reunion ever held. Like most things, it started out as an idea between a couple of individuals, one of which was a Gettysburg veteran. And they said, you know, we're approaching uh, 1913 in the 50th anniversary of what most United Staters at that time considered to be the greatest battle, if not the Civil War, perhaps in all of United States history. And interestingly enough, that idea germinated so quickly that within a matter of days, there was a great meeting at Gettysburg among the community leaders. A meeting following soon after had 150 attendees. And then the governor of, Gettysburg, of, of Pennsylvania got involved. And then the state legislature investing $5,000 of their money, perceived money for this idea. And it soon started to grow up in the National Congress and the United States presidency. Ironically, it took longer to plan than the length of the Civil War itself, five years. But it did grow and quite consistently to the point where people realized this may be the very last time that veterans would come together in a great group of blue and gray before their days were over. The fascinating thing about this was the sheer volume and excitement. There was a massive outpouring of interest that even some organizations and veterans groups were fearing that not many men would attend. They were aging, and this is going to be a very difficult journey. Some had to cr cross the length of the continent to get there. There was a matter of money as well. Many Southern legislators said, we cannot fund this sort of thing. And indeed, there was a desire to not glorify the turning point of the war too much from the South. But the states in the North paid huge amounts of money for their veterans to attend. They were still afraid that not many would go. And they were actually saying, we will pay you to attend this. Fascinating enough, within a matter of months, they had to turn people away. Iowa alone ended up giving $20,000, or about a quarter million dollars to you and me, to fund transportation to the event. Now that is a massive amount of money, considering that Iowa had no regiment at the, at the battle itself. Minnesota gave $25,000. New York, well over $100,000. The United States Congress, $150,000. And the War Department, even more. Nobody gave more than Pennsylvania, the whole state, nearly a half million dollars to make this all possible. Well, it's interesting when this date actually showed up and these throngs of men were coming from north, south, east, and west. There were a multitude of reasons not to go, not the least of which the entirety of the country was experiencing a massive heat wave. There was killing people as far north as northern Michigan. In fact, people in nearby Pittsburgh were camping overnight in parks trying to escape the heat. There were days in cities like Cincinnati and Chicago where more than a half dozen children would die within a 24-hour period, and yet these men came. And there is an explosion. The United States War Department, which was in charge of doing all the infrastructure at the event itself, were estimating that June 29th, a couple of days before the official opening, there would be some early risers that would come. They were estimating there would be about 5,000 attendees. When the day did come of June 29th, the number that arrived was 21,000 and growing fast. The War Department Secretary, a man we'll get to know relatively well by the name of Lindley Garrison, uh, actually chastised the organizers from Pennsylvania and Washington, D.C., saying, this is not the War Department's problem. This is your problem. And the organizers on the ground were saying, this is a fantastic problem. What are you talking about, Secretary? This is ending up being something greater than we ever anticipated. And yet, one must ask, that I didn't even think about until my main editor and wife asked this to me. Why did they go? And that is the purpose of my book and our discussion today. It seems like there would be a, an instantly interesting uh, uh, confusion about this, because of course we all know why they all went, at least as what we've been told, by official histories and by the speech makers who were there. 
the men from the North and South came together in a time of great division of the United States in 1913 to bring the country together, to finally bond North and South, to bury the Civil War behind us forever. Well, something that's interesting about this, all the historic, historiography that has covered this, and I, I, I must forgive my fellow historians for this because there's not a whole lot of information from the ground up, but we don't go get around to asking actually why the actual men attended. We ask politicians and, and generals and, and secretaries of war, but we don't ask individuals like H.H. H. Hodges. And he's one of four people I want to really focus on. And I'm going to focus on him today, and I focus on four in the book. Nobody asked what the individual soldier thought. Why were you going to this place? It's a place of great trauma, by the way. When you were young, your friends, your brothers, your loved ones, your countrymen suffered four years of horrific trauma. Trauma, actually, the ancient Greek word for wound. Now, H.H. H. Hodges is never asked, partly because he's a small man physically and, and economically. He has very little money, never owned any part of the land he ever uh, lived on. Nobody ever asked him, why did you come to this place? There is a reason that many come, and I'm going to talk about four of them in particular, but we also must take into consideration time was a factor. H.H. H. Hodges is 70 years old. The average lifespan of a male in the United States in 1913 was 51. Something also interesting about H.H. H. Hodges is that he did not have a whole lot of money. He's relatively poor. When we look up his service record, from uh, the 21st North Carolina, we find out that his family was so poor that he was not in the Confederate Army when Lee marched off into Pennsylvania. His brother was, and many of his neighbors. He had to take care of the family home and join the war soon after Gettysburg when things were going badly. Now, the thing that I find fascinating about Mr. Hodges is that we see here on his muster sheet the name of Hubert 1B. Because more than likely, his real name was H-U-B-B-A-R-D, because that was his father's name. But I also see it as H.H. H. Hodges and 1B and Hubert Hodges in his records and Herbert Hodges in his records and Hubert Hodges in his records. And I find out it is all the same guy, but there's a reason why. And it came out that when this man from a small town uh, entered the war, and in fact, afterwards, and for the remainder of his life, he, his wife, and one of his daughters never learned to read and write. So when he was able to make this journey, partially because a large amount of private contribution and newspapers raising money and local veterans groups raising money. And in fact, there was a movie house in North Carolina that says for two weeks, all of our proceeds will help North Carolina boys go north. But he was able to travel about two hours from his home on the leeward side of the impoverished Appalachians to get to this train station in Mount Airy. A little side note here, Mount Airy is also known as the place where we saw a television show when we were younger, the Andy Griffith show. That would be this little beautiful town it was, named, uh, it was modeled after. And he would get on this and ironically, he would, that was the closest he would get to any train station. That's how rural his life still was in the 20th century. And then when he got on it, he found several other men and they would travel south first down to Raleigh and then further north until they finally got to Gettysburg. Now, this was not an easy trip for many men, Southerners like Hodges in particular. They had to pass by places like Orange County, the starting point of Lee's offensive in the Wilderness Campaign. They had to go by Arlington and other sites of great trauma to get to Gettysburg, and that itself was a terrible place. Though he did not fight there, many of his relatives did. And he often said, uh, uh, many Confederates said, I feel like I was being watched. And in fact, they were. When the trains would roll through these towns, many people would be on the embankment watching this go through because it was a national event. By the time it took place, it grew much larger than anybody ever anticipated. And when he got off, it was a circus, an utter circus at Gettysburg. He hopped off to see the fact that the people were there. The town itself was still only about 6,000 people. But so many people had showed up that for a time, 
Gettysburg was once again one of the largest cities in Pennsylvania, and indeed the 30th largest city in all the United States for nearly a week. He saw celebration and revelry. He saw all kinds of people offering rides. There was martial music and pies and lemonade stands. People had decorated their homes in, in patriotic bunting. There was all types of throngs. There was newspaper men in a place called Meadboro, a little plot of land just south of the National Cemetery where they set up shop, 150 journalists. 30 different cameramen above their heads, wires and wires of telegraphs going across the United States. And when he went and walked from one of the two train stations that existed at the time, he was there in the north of our picture here in the town of Gettysburg. That's where both the train stations are on the northern edge. And unless a man had a little bit of extra cash to hire a Surrey or a horse cart or a car to make it to the encampment, that was about a mile away, every man, including A.J. Chavez, had to walk. And the fascinating thing is, when they walk through the town of Gettysburg, and they get to the southern edge, and they climb to Cemetery Hill, they saw something that blew their mind. This green area was the size of the encampment. Again, Gettysburg at the time was about 6,000 people. This encampment numbered well over 50,000. It was two miles long and one mile wide. And when they gazed upon it, these men saw a sea, a brown city, they called it, of brand new U.S. Army tents and all kinds of campsites and latrines and often an area that was safe for them. And you see right here in the middle, kitchen after kitchen after bakery after bakery, over 2,000 cooks and bakers alone are operating in this city. They saw and a miracle of new assistance. Anytime they had a, a wave of the hand, a young man would show up in a little, little uniform. This is an organization that was only months old, something called the Boy Scouts of America. And each and every one of them would be there to help carry a bag, help a man to an aid station, do anything he wanted. One officer said that it was strangely familiar to him because he remembered being back in the war a half century before, when his soldiers in uniform were not much older than these young lads. There was also something strange to them in a way, a professional, well-organized medical team, over 70 professionally trained nurses. There's no such thing as a nursing school in the United States during the Civil War. And indeed, the vast majority of nurses in the war itself were not trained and they were male, oftentimes convalescents or enslaved. Here we have professionally trained women, mostly across universities and over a dozen doctors, a multitude of hospitals, the main hospital within the camp itself, ambulances, both car and horse, and an opportunity to make it all the way up to Harrisburg to the main state. Uh, hospital if something seriously went wrong. Over a dozen aid stations at the most popular sites. There were water towers within the camp itself. This is a tiny little town and one of the things that the men knew, and as you know too, what was the number one killer in the Civil War? It wasn't bullets, it was disease. And food and water-based diseases mostly. With this in mind, the state of Pennsylvania organized a team of men to go across the entire watershed of the Pittsburgh area, of the Pennsylvania area around Gettysburg. And that's nearly 50 square miles. And they checked every cistern, every whale, every little stream, and found out a third of these areas were severely contaminated, not far from the percentage that was contaminated during the Civil War itself. So these gentlemen ended up creating a massive plumbing system of water towers and safe drinking areas, tapping into the mains and getting purification stations. You see to the right here on the tent, a gas pump that could operate 24 hours a day. It got to the point by the time they had the anniversary that the celebration could produce 1 million gallons of fresh water each and every day, all of it safe. There's also the refreshing idea to many men who had terrible memories of being dehydrated during the battle itself of water stations all over the place. Bubbling fresh, cool water, cooled by copper coils wrapped by ice underneath the ground. 
one would have a hard time walking more than 100 meters without seeing one of these. And indeed, this is especially tasteful, I think, to men like those on Little Round Top on July 2nd, and indeed those attacking them. One of the saddest stories is that when the 15th Alabama was charging up to try to take the 20th Maine, those men had marched 25 miles without a drop of water in their canteen just to make it to the base of the hill. There is also at the very tip, the southern end of this, right by the Kadori farm, that big red and white structure you see that's along Emmitsburg Road, you're looking at the Great Tent, a massive structure that the organizers put up. And this is where most of the main events and big speeches are going to take place, right at the very tip of the southern area of the Gantman. Give you an idea how big this is. It could hold 13,000 people. That's more than the number of men Robert E. Lee went forward with in Pickett's Charge on July 3rd. This is an enormity. And when men got to the edge of the camp, they had to register and they all gather around these tables wherever they were and be told, this is the number of your street and here's the number of your tent. And that was not an easy task for this place had 40 miles of new gravel roads to follow, laid out in a beautiful grid work, but it was rather confusing to have numbers for both roads and tents. As a consequence, many men forgot both. It was very difficult for about the 10% of Union troops, around 15% to 20% of Confederate veterans who could not read or write. One Union man rec remembered seeing a, a boy in gray saying to him, or an old boy saying, hey, could you put your name down for me? Or put my name down for me? I, 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 he more than likely could not read. And I wonder to what extent it's possible that that was our own H.H. H. Hodges who asked him. Now, how is H.H. H. Hodges going to find his section of camp of North Carolina? Well, fortunately for him, each and every section had a quasi headquarters, a main tent. And they would say, here is the tent of Iowa. Here's the tent of New York. This is what North Carolina did to show where everybody was. They'd say, all right, come down this road and you'll see at the western end this big old foot, great tar heel banner hanging above their camp headquarters. And within several street roads would be the multitude of tents for men like H.H. H. Hodges, H. H. Hodges and others. And when they got there, they would see other individuals. Each tent was supposed to take about eight men. They were hot as a furnace, though brand new. But they did have wash basins and lanterns, directions and times for when breakfast, lunch, and din dinner was. Most of the men who did show up, especially Northerners, would be in civilian attire. With an overwhelming desire for the organizers to make this a military affair, most men really made it about everyday life, as what soldier life was like. They all got brand new cots and two new fresh U.S. Army blankets. Here's a man I hypothesize was either looking for a shady spot to nap or looking for better tent mates. But the amazing thing about this is that one of the very first things these men did after finding where their tent was, and this was universal, was to go to a little knoll, a tiny little spot, an indention, a rock, a set of trees, and he would spend time there. I mean, this was almost universal. And I found out the number one reason why these men came. And that was to find a place of personal meaning. Most of the dialogue coming from the newspapers and the editors and the politicians was, this is a healing moment for the nation. What these men did, the same thing I've seen in World War II veterans in Korea and Vietnam. When given the chance to go back, they don't necessarily go back to the famous places, they go back to places where they had been, where they had been in a particular strait, or somebody had saved them, or they lost somebody who was close to them, a place that had profound meaning in their lives. This more than likely would have been for H.H. H. Hodges. It is the southern end of East Cemetery Hill. It was here on July 2nd where many of his neighbors and friends went up against horrific conditions in the infantry and artillery of Union men who had held this place. And you're looking at the very direction the 21st North Carolina more than likely was looking. If you actually went there today, you would 
just take a few steps over this wall, which is still there. And to your left, see the great archway to Evergreen Cemetery. You could also see, as we do here, the statue of Winfield Scott Hancock. That statue was only up a few months before this anniversary took place. Now let's get to the actual official event itself, July 1st, the first day of the anniversary. Well, suit, uh, suitably, the organizers call it Veterans Day. Well, that's great. So a multitude of people showed up in the great tent at three o'clock in the afternoon at the height of the heat of the day to listen to speeches. Now you'd think there would be some veterans there. Well, the very first main speech comes from an individual who gets up to the top of the rostrum with 200 dignitaries, bankers, and others sitting on it as well. He looks into the rostrum and says, so long as men love valor and worship heroes, the name of Gettysburg and of those who fought there will be ever on their lips. No man of pure spirit ever lived than those who waged it upon the respective sides. Well, his individual glorifying war was none other than Lindley Garrison, the Secretary of War. Well, you'd think because he's a Secretary of War, he would be um, a fine, suitable candidate to be the keynote speaker of the very first day. But the interesting thing about Lindley Garrison is he really favored the United States having an aggressive overseas policy in 1913 in places like the Philippines and in Central America, despite the fact Lindley Garrison was not a veteran, had never served in the army, and never seen a day of combat. Well, those actually a minority of veterans who attended the event just came out a little disappointed, saying, boy, that was hot, and I didn't know I was a god of war. I was rather unaware that war was full of valor and glory. Having experienced it here myself, I'm not all that convinced. He's right, but there is one thing I do know about this organization. I'm grateful for Garrison and others because they said, man, gosh, ain't this great food. They were told in their invitation, you will be served U.S. rations, not unlike the kind you were served in the war. When these men arrived, they thought that actual invitation was some sort of ruse. They saw the 2,000 bakers and the fresh bread and the smell of coffee in the air anytime day or night available to them. And their lunches were absolutely amazing. The very first breakfast had string beans and pulled pork. They had ice cream available to them and lemonade and coffee and tea. They could eat as much as they possibly want and more. These men also realized that when they got together to eat, it wasn't only the food that enriched them rich them, but it was the idea of sitting next to people they had not seen, many of them, for a half century. And when we get into that, we realize there's another reason why we're here. And I think out of the four reasons, reason number two is to find old comrades. Now, when we're talking about the reunion, the organizers did something interesting. You're seeing an organized map of that two mile by one mile a massive tent city and the organized avenues and streets therein. Each and every little tiny dot that you can barely see is one of those tents. And I can tell you that it was laid out in states. Here is the largest contingent, there are nearly 20,000 men, Pennsylvanians. Here is my home state of Iowa. If you uh, look behind the McKinnick House uh, along Confederate Avenue, that right behind that house is where the Iowa men were Here's the New Jersey area where some men were uh, uh, avoided for some odd reason, I don't know. And here's North Carolina, the long travel that our great H.H. H. Hodges would make. The unfortunate thing about this, it wasn't bad for H.H. H. Hodges and others, but for most men, the organizer said, you will be placed in the state section where you currently live. Now, if you think about this for a second, there's going to be a problem. These men want to reconnect with their regiments and their companies. The organizers said, we don't care what company you served in. We don't care what state you served for. We will put you in where you live now. Now, that's going to be a bit of a problem. 
because about 10% of the Indiana troops were Confederate. Many men in Indiana had come from other states in North South. There were all kinds of individuals from California and Arizona, Washington and Oregon, and of course, Iowa, who had not had any regiments at that particular battle. They had spread across the country for various purposes. And then when they got there, they realized, I am not where I need to be. And anybody looking for me doesn't know where I am. 1913 actually happens to be the third time that the veterans of Pickett's Charge, if you will, members of Pickett's Division, plus those of the Philadelphia Brigade that fought against each other. It was the third time they had met. And before the event ever showed up, ever happened, these two groups said to the organizers, hey, could we be camped together? And the organizers said, no, nah, too difficult. We're not going to do that. So one of my favorite stories, and a heartbreaker that is, is an individual who had served actually at Gettysburg in the U.S. Mil uh, US artillery, the same artillery union, uh, unit that had plowed into Pickett's Charge massive amounts of, of grape shot. And one of these guys was actually placed in Indiana. He said, no, I, I, I served in a U.S. unit here. And his name was William Pickett, so he went by Frank. But he was put in the Indiana area. And he goes, all right, fine. I'll, I'll go see if I can't find uh, some of my men from the U.S. He could never find any individual from his U.S. artillery area. Previous, before Gettysburg, he had served in the 14th Indiana. He goes, okay, fine. I'll go find them. He goes across the length of the entire encampment, is directed toward the Indiana section, and has 64 tents therein, and he just went down, tent after tent after tent after tent said, you with Company B, uh, 14th Indiana. Anybody, Company B, 14th Indiana, anybody. He finally gets to one of the very last tents, looks in the back, and a man with familiar eyes looks back at him and says, it's me, Frank. I'm the only one. If men truly wanted to find out where many of their comrades were, they would go to the great national cemetery. And this, of course, was a place of healing and coping for many men when they were looking for their comrades. The way these men reacted when they would finally come upon a name of somebody from their state was ranging anywhere from quiet contemplation to absolute sadness. Indeed, many of these men, then and now, still talk about finding grave sites of their comrades and cannot see them beyond the age of when they, they died. One veteran was found weeping right next to one of the flat stones with a name on it. And all he could say over and over again is, he's under there. Eventually he collapsed and people had to carry him to an aid station. The sad thing about this is that as Gettysburg and elsewhere, there's a multitude of unknown soldiers for the Union and for the Confederacy. I think one of the saddest statistics I've ever encountered in the entirety of my scholastic career is nearly 40% of all Union troops who died in the war, and well over 50% of Confederate troops who died in the war, are buried in unmarked graves. Now we can talk about Appomattox and Robert E. Lee and U.S. Grant shaking hands and bringing peace and brotherhood to Robert E. Lee and U.S. Grant. The rest of us had to fix the garbage that they destroyed. There are hundreds of thousands of families after the war who, because they don't know where their loved one was buried, never got a sense of closure. This is also the case at Gettysburg for the about 8,500 Confederate veterans because they don't have a national cemetery. Nearly every identifiable body and many unknown that were indeed Confederate years after the battle were dragged down to Richburg and buried in the Hollywood Cemetery, as you know. Now let's look at the second day and the organizers call it Military Day. Well, that's wonderful. And there's more events in the great tent. But one of the journalists noticed a pattern that had already developed. He said, the exercises in the great tent were interesting, impressive, and well attended, but there seemed to be more pleasure for the majority in wandering over the battlefield or visiting about in the camp. And something that also struck me when I read about that and read about what the soldiers were actually doing I also saw photograph after photograph of women 
at the event. The interesting thing about this is when these men got their invitation and said they were only going to get U.S. rations and going to be living in tents just like the war, they were also told, you will not bring any family members. All food, all tents, all accommodations were for the veterans alone, and you better have your documentation with you. Do not bring your families. Well, so many of the men brought their families, especially those who were close. One man actually said, I can bring you with me this time, Jenny. Photograph after photograph of families coming. That, and even women in town who were not supposed to come to the camp were invited in. They would invite men to their house to eat, and then the men would invite them back to their, their uh, state area to have picnics with them. It was a beautiful, very civilian concept. And we see from, uh, from many uh, uh, historians, Carolyn Jannon and uh, Barbara Cannon and others, that there's something fascinating about the U.S. soldier in the Civil War. He wasn't really a soldier. He was an individual who, by way of volunteering or drafting or otherwise, was pulled into a war that he would hope would not last very long, but it ended up being much worse than the absolute worst nightmare scenarios would find out to be. And any given moment, these, in, these individuals, while in camp, while in convalescence, would revert back to their civilian ways during the Civil War. They would try to practice the craft they had when they were back home. Many men would try to find printing presses if they were editors or writers. There are men who are horse lovers who would go off into the farms and see the areas and how crops are being raised. Others who would actually take care of some of the steeds around the camp, trying to refine what they were. And they did that here too at Gettysburg. I found out that by way of calculation, about 97% of the young men who went and fought off in the Civil War had never been part of the U.S. military. They were very much before, after, and indeed during the war, a civilian at heart. Speaking of civilians, uh, the great historian Gregory Coco uh, found something rather tragic about the Battle of Gettysburg, that it wasn't seen as the great decisive battle by the two commanders. And as a consequence, after July 4th, when Robert E. Lee pulled south and George Gordon Meade would follow him, those two men brought with them somewhere between 80 and 90 percent of all of their doctors, all of their ambulances, all of their medicine. And who was left behind to take care of somewhere around 15 to 17,000 wounded? At that time, the population of Gettysburg was only 1,000. The vast majority of people who were pulled into action and their home, homes were turned into hospitals, were women. And there was a massive number of nurse women who came back to the anniversary. I don't know if she ever did come back, but there was one story of a woman who was turned into a nurse during the battle itself. She had run away from home because her father didn't want her to be out there in the danger at night, but she would assist a surgeon, uh, and oftentimes in amputations by candlelight. And this isn't anything necessarily new at Gettysburg or anywhere else, but I found this story rather interesting because that person who was helping that surgeon, that girl was 10 years old. Now let's look at July 3, the ultimate day of the battle. The organizers called it Governor's Day. Seriously, got to work on your, on your branding, guys. But at least the organizers were fair to their own term. Among the speakers at the great tent at the heat of the day were about 10 governors. Not a single one of them from the North was a veteran. One veteran from the South uh, uh, was a governor who went on and on about how great war was and how the South really was never defeated. You think we're divided today, look at 1913, let alone 1865. But the organizers had a special treat outside of the tent at three o'clock at the height of the heat of the day. And long before three o'clock, people started to come to the site, this, this, this angle of stones, this bloody angle here near the cops of trees. And something special was going to happen. It was an organization, uh, something organized not by the veterans, but by other organizers. And many men of the Philadelphia Brigade, especially the ones from the 72nd Pennsylvania, you have to show up here. Well, they show up in a crowd and they have to worm their way through. And behind this, this long strip of, 
of rope. And they're, they're, they're waiting and going, oh, yeah, we're, we're here where we were on July 3rd at Pickett's Charge. What are we doing? They go, just, just, just wait. And then uh, across the entire encampment to get there, mostly from the Virginia section, were members of, of Pickett's division. Well, they left their tents here in the Virginia section and had to walk that nearly that mile. And by the way, they're walking through those tent rows and the tent cities and the, and the Timothy grass and the rope wires. And in the middle, you see they're crossing actual train tracks. Well, leading them on this great charge reenactment, if you will, was a, a local band that was playing Dixie over and over and over again. And when they finally got to the wall, it was a painful process. In fact, one uh, journalist said this was slow and painful. One veteran from the 72nd Pennsylvania said it took him about 20 minutes back in 1863 to get here. Now I don't know if they're going to make it at all. Many of these men are exhausted, trying to help each other walk. It's over an hour to get to the wall. Some are there with pin sleeves. Others have crutches for missing limbs. And they're walking across the rutted field to get here. In 30 steps, 30 steps before they reach their fellow survivors of Gettysburg on the other side of the wall, the organizers say, stop right where you are. We have a special treat for you. Another speech. On top of the wall climbs one J. Hampton Moore, a U.S. congressman from the district, uh, the 5th district of Pennsylvania, the quasi uh, area of the representative of the men there from Philadelphia. And he gets on top of the wall. And the interesting thing about J. Hampton Moore, uh, he's not a veteran either. He was born after the battle and his entire career was based on banking. And for well over 20 minutes, in that blinding heat, he tells the men a blow by blow account of Pickett's charge saying again and again, you did this, and you did that, and you thought this. Uh, I keep wondering if some of the men in that area were going, yeah, I've been there, done that. Wait, no, I've been here, done that, little mister. Things got so bad that one man collapsed and had to be taken away by stretcher. Finally, after a half an hour more of standing in the heat, the organizer said, the event, quote, is over. You may go back. It wasn't over. That's when it began. That's when the veterans on both sides crawled across the wall and did the same thing they've been doing all week, finding a spot of particular meaning, finding an individual who is there with them. One man actually for 30 minutes was staring across the wall saying, I think that guy's familiar. And it turns out he was. That Union soldier and Confederate soldier had seen each other during the battle and re remembered that one man was carrying a pistol and shot at his brother. The other man felt guilty and said, well, maybe if I had a brother, you shot at him too, and we'll, we're even. And they would talk about trying to piece together something that had been a mystery to them, something condensed in fog and confusion for years and years. And in small groups, they gathered together and pieced together one of the most monumental events of their life. Some laughed, some cried. There were pictures being taken. Uh, There's many, believe it or not, uh, people taking photographs at this time that were not in the press. This was the age of that $1 great Kodak Brownie. It had just come out a few years uh, earlier and become rather ubiquitous. People were being able to record their own history. But when they did, and when the journalists did, they were taking photographs of men in blue and gray, hugging and laughing. They said, the nation is healed. In reality, the men were trying to heal themselves. Many of them weren't even thinking about the possibility, let alone the desire, to unify the nation. These men still had great animosity for the governments they fought against. But the men who had served at that time in that place were just as young and just as frightened as they were. And when they could see the living proof that an individual had indeed survived that war, that onslaught, each man felt truly like a survivor. And that is reason number three, to find other survivors. 
is keep in mind that as bad as it is in Afghanistan, Iraq, and Syria, and it's heartbreaking every time we hear of a loss, one out of four Confederate troops and one out of six Union troops did not return from the Civil War. We look at something like this as the ultimate uh, uh, vision of the anniversary, the great handshakes across the wall. Well, I, germ uh, I learned from um, Jim Heiser from the Gettysburg uh, Museum Library that uh, this was actually, very few people paid attention to this at all. If you can look in the background, you can see the great tent. And beyond that is um, Seminary Hill. This is actually not the front wall. This is the side wall. And after the event was over and all these people were mingling, some photographer said, hey, could you give me, guys, give me a, a nice little uh, a symbolic shot. And those on the left were more than likely men from the 72nd Pennsylvania. But those on the right, for the most part, are Confederate veteran organizers. Uh, and as far as identifying these individuals, Jim Heiser, I think you, none of these guys were actually part of Pickett's Charge. They were just standing in that open area where the North Carolina had charged and uh, were just sitting there open and around and were available for a handshake. Almost nobody paid any attention to this photograph during the anniversary itself. These men were far more occupied with spending time with each other. Eventually, after World War I, uh, psychologists in the new field and others would call it the talking cure. Here's how men would be able to cope. When they're back home and alone and lonely, they couldn't talk to their family members. Uh, they had a difficult time finding fellow veterans, especially those who had lived, who had moved far away from home. But here, they were able to, get, able to gather again and reconnect with those who, even by a handshake and look in the eye, could understand explicitly what that fellow human being went through and what each other needed to cope with that moment. Now, the organizers uh, said, we have one last great treat for you. Uh, it was going to be on July 4th, but for various reasons, we're going to be having it on July 3rd. And for many days, there were engineers digging holes in platforms on the side of the little round top here. And train after train were bringing in all kinds of equipment and, and, and barrels and boxes and crates. I said, this is what you want for a big, great, wonderful end, a crescendo to this great event. We are going to give you veterans a fireworks display. Now, if any of you know about post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, one of the symptoms is great aversion to bright lights and loud noises. And one journalist noted this, that when this went on from nine o'clock onward, by some estimates for about two hours, there were 14,000 cars circling around the whole area and most of them were filled with veterans, uh, uh, well, civilians. There are all kinds of little picnic sites and people on blankets looking up and being amazed by this for the veterans. The veterans had a hard time dealing with it. And most of them just got together and talked while the bright lights and flashing bombs burst overhead. One individual, individual said, it's a little too close to the memories of combat. And now we come upon the final official day, National Day. And this is going to be a relatively big event. The, the President of the United States was originally not going to come, and he realized when this event got so huge that he had to attend. It was then politically very problematic. He didn't. So he did show up in, uh, in a car, and he was surrounded by well-adorned generals and members of the U.S. military, and he walked uh, to a car, and they drove that car down with the governor of Pennsylvania and others, a corridor of serving U.S. troops who had made a lane for the president to go down. And saluting them were operating U.S. cavalry and blasting into the sky were celebratory salutes from the U.S. 3rd Artillery. Had this great militaristic affair to it. I find this photograph one of the most interesting of the Union. As he got out of the car, untouched by veterans, and about to walk into the tent, uh, President Wilson was told, please turn around. Uh, we've got an individual here in blue, an individual here in gray. 
we want them to stand right next to you. And for this one brief moment, this photograph here, this is the one and only time Woodrow Wilson had any contact with any veteran at Gettysburg. He went up on the speech after a lot of introductions and ballyhoo, and maybe, maybe 40% of those in the tent were veterans, but that would be a very liberal uh, number. The vast majority were civilians. Most of the men were still outside looking for places of meaning, finding veterans, seeking out survivors, while he gave a rather tepid speech. And he said, very much like so many other politicians and bankers and businessmen had said from that rostrum, we are made by these tragic, epic things to know what it costs to make a nation, the blood and sacrifice of multitudes of unknown men. Well, the men didn't know they were unknown, at least not to their friends and their families. And then as soon when this was over, the president, who was rather not sensitive to the needs and wants of the veterans, let alone what they wanted to say, walked out of the back of the tent, into a car, got into a train, and left. In 1863, when Lincoln came to Gettysburg to give his oft-quoted address, he spent 24 hours there. Woodrow Wilson spent about 45 minutes. And in fact, in doing so, he missed the last great, wonderful thing about this entire event, a, a, a 4th of July celebration that the men thought most appropriate, rather than explosions and fire and, and loudness and, and streamers. At noon, all the bells around town would ring for five minutes, and all of those who could stand would stand in silence in honor of those who had fallen during the battle and those who had fallen ever since in memory of their friends and brothers and comrades and fellow survivors who had endured this horrible war. And finally, when it was over, H.H. H. Hodges and his companions got back on their trains on the 4th and the 5th. The terribly sad thing about Hodges, though, is one of the reasons why I know about him this man who would otherwise be invisible to me, is that right before he was to file in and get back to his wife of 50 years, whom he had very rarely been away from except during the Civil War, H.H. H. Hodges collapsed and died. While men like here, Lindley Garrison, talked about how wonderful war was and how great this if the United States is now unified, they can take a more aggressive stand in places like the Philippines, in places like the Pacific, in places like Central America and Mexico, and indeed, if need, in Europe. But men like H.H. H. Hodges were now in a casket, unknown, told that they are necessary sacrifices for the survival of their country, and lost to history. One of the ironies of this place of peace at Gettysburg is that it looked a lot like uh, the fields of Flanders. So when the United States does become entangled a couple of years later in this war in Europe, one of the things they do with the Gettysburg National Battlefield, which is part of the War Department at the time, is to have tank practice on the field itself. As far as the men go though, uh, it's not unlike World War II, it's not unlike Vietnam, it's not unlike Korea and elsewhere that we keep listening to the speeches of the presidents and the generals talking about how we need to lose people in order to live. But whether or not you believe that, at least know that it's a strong tradition, that the Aztecs believed this, the Greeks did, the Romans did, the Jews and Christians made their religions based on the idea of human sacrifice. Whether or not a veteran believes this, it'd be best to ask the veteran one thing I love about my country is that we do come together in times of crisis. When we're really hurting, we do show the best of ourselves during a tornado, an earthquake, a fire, unemployment. We do take care of each other, but it's at the community level. And I fear that when we think in national terms, we do something with our veterans time and time and again, and I do it too. 
that we do a lot of talking at them. We don't necessarily do a lot of listening to them. And this is reason number four, to reaffirm life itself. Nearly every veteran I've ever encountered doesn't cherish death. They cherish life. It's one of the reasons like, they fight like hell for each other to keep each other alive. And it doesn't matter what country. I've seen this from many people from different walks of life, from different economic groups. They are not, and human beings are not, born killers. And that's one of the reasons why I finally learned to shut up and listen to veterans. For they, among others, have taught me volumes. The ability to listen, the ability to empathize, the ability to understand and to look at a human being not as some sort of symbol, not to put him on a pedestal out of reach, but to realize he and she are fellow human beings too, and they have much to teach me. And I'm still learning, and I hope you are too. Thank you for joining me in this journey. I hope you take heart and are able to listen to veterans. And if you are a veteran yourself, please, as difficult as it can be, talk to others. Go to the veterans organizations. Reach out to friends, family, uh, strangers even, just to share your story. Time and again, I've seen veterans who have done this feel absolutely wonderful, just as those at Gettysburg felt when they were able to open up and share their experiences. So thank you very much. And if you want to read more about this event, uh, my book um, published by Kent State University last year is available at Amazon.com, Barnes & Noble, and most major museums. If you're interested in contacting me for any reason whatsoever, please email me at trflagel, that's F as in Frederick, L-A-G-E-L at yahoo.com. Thank you very much and take good care of yourself.